I am reminded that I, uh, when I hear music, almost music of almost any kind, uh, it's such a blessing. And uh, may, well, maybe I shouldn't say of any kind, but uh, certainly music is a blessing. And uh, when I hear that song, it reminds me of a girl in my church in the past that, and you've heard me say that before, that listened to that song, and not because I sang it so badly, I don't think, but because of the words, uh, people need the Lord. And uh, she would weep and uh, went to be with the Lord. Well, many years before she should have, but uh, I think I want to ask Frank just to put a picture on the screen. Um, I don't want to make you feel bad. I want you. To, I just want you to remember some things in prayer. And so the, it's a picture. Those are just a few of the children uh, that have been kidnapped uh, in Israel. And if you look at those, they could be your children, could be your grandchildren. And uh, we don't know the horrible things that are happening to them, but let's uh, remember Israel as we pray every day. Now, I know there are innocent victims on both sides, but Israel is the people of God, and uh, let's, let's just remember them. Let's pray together. Father, we bow our hearts in your presence this morning humbly and sincerely. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you for your loving kindness and grace. We thank you for all that you are and all that you do. We thank you that you watch over us and you care for us, even when we do not realize that, when we don't understand it. You said, I'm with you always. And so we thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives. We thank you that you love us to the degree that because of Jesus, we can come into the Holy of Holies this morning and talk to you, into the very throne room of the Father. And we love you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for all that you are and all that you do. I pray this morning for every need that's represented here. There are all kinds of needs. There are physical needs. There are spiritual needs. There are family needs, domestic concerns financial difficulties, you care about all of that. And if we turn to you and we seek you and we're faithful to you, then <laughs> we're in your hands and you, you take care of us and you minister to us and we can testify to that. So many times we come to you only when we have a, a need. We come to you only when we want help. But Lord, help us to talk to you as a friend talks to a friend day after day. Thank you for your loving kindness and for your grace. Thank you for your faithfulness. We love you today. And I pray, Lord, that you would be with the nation of Israel. Pray, O oh Lord, that for their protection. We know that this, this war goes back between two brothers in the early days of the Jews, and it's, it has continued on throughout the centuries. But Israel, is your, they are your people. And for those who are innocent victims on both sides of this war, we pray for them. They're always innocent victims, and we pray, oh God, that they'll turn to you, and they'll lift their hands to you, and they'll trust you. We pray for our nation. Our nation needs prayer. We pray for our leaders. We pray, oh God, for our community and for our community leaders. We pray today for one another, and we are so thankful, Lord, that you love us, that you care for us in a way that is beyond our understanding, but we thank you. Pray now, Lord, that you would lead us and guide us and direct us in this gathering today. We love you, and we thank you for amazing grace. In Jesus' name, we pray. Hear us now as we pray the prayer of our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I think about the, um, everything that's going on in the world and, and also of the things that are going on in our lives, and we come together and we, we, we are concerned about our, our concerns, but we don't realize that everyone has, everyone's struggling. Uh, everyone has a struggle, a difficulty. And I played something for you from the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. I want to play the same song for you again, because I don't know about you, but you look at me and you think, well, the pastor's doing well, everything's fine, but everything's not fine. It's not fine with any of us. And uh, we were able to get in on David Phelps' concert. Uh, David Phelps is one of the greatest tenors in gospel music. He also sings incredible um, uh, opera. He can just do about everything. And there's one song that really speaks to me, and I thought I may just play this during the, the, uh, the sermon, but I just weep sometimes when I think about it won't be long. Heaven isn't a myth. Heaven isn't a myth, folks. It won't be long until we'll have our hand in Jesus and we'll be walking and talking and, and, and have fellowship with one another. It won't be long. Well, it won't be long for me because I'm old enough. I'm not going to live to be 100 anyway. See, But, but I'm not so sure it's going to be so long anyway. Maybe we'll talk about that. I'm not a, I'm not a, a teacher of prophecy, but what I see is amazing in this world. But listen to, to David sing this song and just listen to the words. It's really, really quite blessing. I'll talk just for a minute. I won't spend the time there, so don't get all excited and think, oh, I think I'll leave. Uh, but just a couple of things about what's going on. Today we're being constantly either lied to or being given exaggerated statistics in almost every area of life. Just turn on the television, won't take long, read the newspaper. By the media outlets, the environmental concerns, people, the major corporations, the pharmaceutical companies, the medical field, the teachers' union, some of the teachers' unions, all approved, in fact, almost all initiated in Washington, D.C. However, not just in America, that's happening all over the world if you look at the trends that are changing. Uh, and then, of course, the question, are these the last days? Well, we might want to talk about that sometime. We're more interested in talking about today and people coming to know Christ, but there are questions, so we might talk about that sometime. The, Bible, the old song says, signs of the times are everywhere. There's a brand new feeling in the air. That was a long time ago when that was written, but there really is a lot of that that's happening now, a good feeling. There's revival happening in so many places, they just kind of pop up on my phone in, in this country or in that country or, or at this college or university, and it's, it's amazing. And I see more and more uh, like Christian uh, testimonies and so forth on uh, my phone than i ever seen before. So God is doing something. I will say this, the, glo the global church is going to make an incredible, powerful impact on society. We, we really have, we're not part of the global church, but we, did, we made the right decision. It's making a powerful, I am so impressed with what I see and what I read and the people I know and the people I talk to and find out what's happening in that church. So America, of course, is becoming a cesspool of sin. It's kind of been a little that way for a while, but it gets worse. But God is still at work. He's still on the throne. He says, nothing is impossible with me. All things are possible with God. Now, another current subject, and I bring that up just to lead it into my message, is we talk about white supremacy. But you know something? You could probably get all the organized white supremacy groups in all the United States together, and they wouldn't fill one coliseum. They're just little splinter groups, but this is all taken advantage of just to stir up problems, and it's a false narrative. Critical race theory, although it sounds noble, its current goal is designed to create division. 
it might have had some, some good ideas in it. I can, read, I can read the lines in it, but it's a flawed narrative where personal histories do not matter. Cust uh, character counts for nothing, and individual circumstances count for nothing, and responsibility, my own personal responsibility, are, they are inconsequential. And then there's another thing, Black Lives Matter, which is resurrected CRT, and the founder is a Marxist, in other words, a person that wants to destroy America. I mean, all you have to do is read it, it's there, it's just that most people don't read, they listen to what someone tells them, and they believe it. Okay, all of this is based on false narratives, at least, for the most part, false narratives. If there is genuine concern, and I'm sure there is among some of those people, what would they be? What would they be? Simply this. If they're genuine, people matter. People matter. All people matter. WWJD, what did that say? All people matter. And then what would Jesus do? How would he respond? So let's see. First in Mark 3, the religious leaders are jealous over the growing popularity of Jesus. Now we go back hundreds and hundreds of years. And they're looking for a plan to discredit Jesus in a very public setting. Let's go, we'll look at Mark 3 for just a moment. Go to Mark 3, if you would like. All I have to do is find it. Did I not mark it well? Mark, Mark, there we go. Mark 3, and let's look at verse 1. Matter of fact, let's read down. Make sure I have the right one. In the, in the, now, in the preceding chapter, Jesus has rebuffed the Pharisees with the words, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now, we have looked at that. That's maybe the only command of the Ten Commandments that's flexible. I really believe it's flexible. So, let's, let me read Mark, beginning with one. Another time, he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. And some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the, with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. And then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And they were silent. They didn't have anything to say. He looked at, at them with anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. And then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they would kill Jesus. The Tenth Commandment states one should not work on the Sabbath. And we talked about that, so I won't, go, I won't spend much time there because we just went through all the commandments. But they added a lot of rules and regulations because we want to be sure that someone doesn't accidentally break the rule. So the Sabbath laws are interesting, to say the least. Most of you remember we talked about it, but there are 39 bylaws that have been made since the Sabbath, since that one Sabbath commandment, and they include carrying. I couldn't do this. Lifting, that would be, that would be work. Carrying, uh, what else? Uh, you remember we, we talked about that uh, quite a bit. How about... Uh, extinguishing, or burning, or riding, or erasing, or cooking, or washing, or sowing, or plowing, or planting, or reaping, or starting a fire, or walking too many steps on the Sabbath. You see, the, the Pharisees are very religious, but they're not godly. They're not spiritual. If it was the New Testament, you'd say they're not Christians. You'd say they're religious. They're visiting and using the law to destroy, not to heal. So probably they hatch a plan. We don't know quite what happened, but maybe they hatch a plan. The Pharisees invite Jesus to give a talk at the synagogue. Of course, he does that a lot on a Sabbath day. And the plan is find a, happy, a handicapped man who may be coming all the time anyway and bring him to worship, hoping that Jesus might heal him. And then they could give thanks to God, right? No, no. If he healed the man, it would be an exertion of energy which they considered works, then the Pharisees can discredit him. So what it really is, it's a sting operation. Jesus stands up to speak. He sees this poor man with a disfigured arm, and Jesus has compassion. That's a key word there for Jesus. Jesus has compassion. Then he sees the crowd, and it's packed with religious leaders. 
And they're leaning forward in anticipation. There's a spirit of expectancy. They're hoping for a miracle. I used to have a, a sign in front of my church. I didn't put it there. I think something said a certain lady put it there, but it wasn't inappropriate. It didn't look bad, so I just left it there. It said, expect a miracle. Well, they were hoping and expecting a miracle, but from all the wrong reasons. It wasn't a good spirit. Come on, Jesus, heal him, and then we will nail you, and ultimately we will arrest you. Now, the Bible records that Jesus seizes up the situation, and he becomes very angry. He's grieved at their insensitivity and caring for people. They're, these religious people, they don't care at all about the man with the withered arm. They couldn't care less. They don't care about this man, his sad life. They don't care anything about his destiny. They're using him as a tool to destroy Jesus. And Jesus knows the hardness of their hearts. And he knows that healing the man is going to cost something. But people matter. And Jesus asked the man, he said, stretch out your hand. Yeah, the withered one. Stretch out your hand. And what did the Pharisees say? God be praised, this man can now live a normal life. No, no, no. They said, Sabbath day violation, Sabbath day violation. Why did Jesus heal the man? Compassion. But he's also making a statement that all people matter. You know, I picked these up on the way in. I'm not sure which one. Anyway, I never did. I never was able to do this, Rich. Remember the guys that at the quartets, they hold up things and they say, want to sell? We want to sell our tapes. Actually, I think these are $10 or free, aren't they? Whichever, whichever they want to give back there, but it all goes back into the church. But Rich had just written the song on which, the ch God's Chain of Love. Was that our first CD? Anyway, God's Chain. You wrote that song, right? Okay. I didn't want to give you credit, only where credit is due. And he wrote this song, God's Chain of Love. Think about that, a chain of love. That's, that's fantastic. About a man who changed. Now, we, I know we talked about this before, but we kind of just stuttered through it just kind of on the spur of the moment. Uh, about a man who changed a tire for a very wealthy lady in her very expensive car. She sat there for about an hour. She finally, uh, finally, a man came along in an old pickup truck. Can I help you, ma'am? You sure can. Uh, and he changed the tire. She tried to pay him, and, and he just said something like, well, just help someone else. Uh, pay it forward. You don't, mean, you don't owe me anything. And she offered thanks, and then she went on her way, and then she stopped for dinner at a local diner. And her waitress was very pregnant, very pregnant, so much so that she wondered, why is this lady even working in the lyrics of the song? And when the waitress returned to the table, she discovered that the customer had left, and an envelope containing $100 bills was left there, money that was absolutely going to help meet the needs of that she was facing at that time. She went home, told her husband about the miracle. And she discovers that her husband is the man who had changed the tire. His name was Rob, changed the tire earlier the same day of that same lady. But there's a part two to that story. <laughs> uh, Richie and I and Art Bain, whose studio we recorded in, are at a restaurant. And Art is something of a music legend. I've heard Rich talk about him many times and got to meet him, I think, three years in a row. And we're sitting at the table with at least one other music legend. I don't know him, but even while we're there, someone walks up and says, hey, you're so-and-so. Oh, wow. Okay. So we're sitting around the table. Marsha's there to pick me up. She's driven over through Georgia. And guess what? Our waitress is a very, very very pregnant lady. And Marcia talked to her. And Marcia discerned a need. I don't even know what they talked about. And then she did something really cool. She turned to Rich. <laughs> and she said, Rich, what are we going to do? She didn't turn to me. She turned to Rich. I like that. And Rich said, what do you mean? What are we going to do? <laughs> but we took up an offering or a tip. I don't remember how large it was. And we gave it to her. I think it was substantial. And all I can say is that one day in heaven, my guess, we get to hear the rest of the story. She'll say, this is what I used the money for, and this is how it helped the baby, and so forth. People matter to God. I suppose we all have our favorite people. I mean, James said, you have your favorite kinds of people, and I have mine. But at the same level, that isn't right, and it isn't good. My favoritism has to be exposed not to others, but to myself, to me. 
It must be repented of. Perhaps I need a transformation from the inside out, as did St. Paul, and he experienced it. In Romans 2.11, it says, with God, there is no partiality of any kind. Favoritism splits churches. It, it, it causes fights, uh, neighborhood shootings, bombings, anything, everything. What's the origin of partiality and prejudice and racism, for that matter? In other words, if I'm prejudiced and I'm partial, why? Well, we won't go too deep into that, but research tells us that the fault lies most of the time with the parents. If mom and dad criticize and berate people because of ethnicity or gender or a belief system or socioeconomic status, it's likely the children will develop the same fault-finding attitude. In fact, research suggests that the intensity can increase from one generation to the next. Another source of partiality or an attitude of superiority is peer groups Learn primarily, I guess, in junior high and high school and all the stories of bullying and so forth. Peer pressure at that age is a very powerful motivator. I never let those kind of things bother me in school, but a lot of kids, a lot of young, a lot of young people did. And once the poison of partiality or bias gets into my system, there's almost no way, no human way to get it out. It's always going to be there. It takes something supernatural to take it out to root it out. So we see Jesus taking every opportunity to expose this kind of evil. There's also something else. Hopefully we're not guilty of that, but there's also religious favoritism. Imagine people who live far from God most of their lives, but they stumble into a relationship with Christ. That's not exactly the way it happens, but it appears that way. They go to church, they hear that God loves them, that Jesus died for their sins, they can have a new life, and so they come into the family of God after all those years. And about five or six years later, you know what they're doing? They're looking down their noses at people who are just like they were five or six years ago and criticizing. They even begin to isolate themselves from people that use bad language or people who have questionable values. So we often see Jesus associating with, quote, bad people. Not so he could participate in their sin, but so they could get to know him. Now, let's look at another New Testament guy. James is perhaps the most practical, maybe the most direct book in the New Testament. So you can be, you can be, you can be certain that something in his book, something the writer has to say, will speak to you. I want, I want to hear these words. In fact, James 2, let me read a couple of verses from James 2, verse 1 and 2. My brothers, as believers in our precious, in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and among judges with evil thoughts? That's pretty clear. Now, Romans 2.11 says from the Apostle Paul, for God does not show favoritism. You like to know an unflattering little secret, I guess it's not really a secret, about all of us. Most of us, we have an unpublished list of people. And some we tend to like and some we could live without. And we have a list of desirables and we have a list of deplorables. In fact, I had, <laughs> I had two of those deplorables in one church. We don't talk much about that, but I did. But we don't discuss that. In fact, most of us, we don't admit that we have favorites or hold any prejudice. It wasn't in this church, by the way, of course not. And we all have preferences. Some work hard to remain with those who are affluent. And some are annoyed by the poor, and some are annoyed by the needy, and some are also annoyed by snobs, and some people prefer academia, and some prefer the common folk. Now, I have a dear friend. When I tell this story, nobody's going to get it, I promise. Not even people watching it on YouTube. But I have a dear friend who is very nice, a good person. She's been a helpful asset to me. I was able to help her also after she made bad choices in her vocation. She worked for me. But the truth is, this is the truth. She's incredibly ineffective. She's incredibly uninspiring. She's a really a bit humdrum. But you know what I noticed in recent years? Some time ago, she's now working for an organization that I believe 
has hired her for her pedigree instead of her ability. She has a doctorate. In fact, she may have a PhD. Oh, I'm really happy for her, you understand. I'm very happy for her. She had those degrees when she worked for me. So I know her. You know what I think she is? I think she's their kind of people. In other words, her, decree, her degrees, her coat of arms, her rank makes them look good. And maybe that's one of the reasons she was hired. I'm glad for her. But she's their kind of people. Partiality. Favoritism. One day Jesus said, or one day Jesus and the disciples are traveling and it's hot and dusty and they're hungry and they're thirsty and they arrive at a well and the disciples go to a nearby town to find food and in the meantime, a woman approaches, you know the story, at, at the well where he is and I think Jesus knew that she was coming and he again breaks the rules. He's breaking the rules again. This was after all a woman. Not just any woman, this was a Samaritan woman. She's from the northern kingdom. And that's bad. But Jesus spends a long time in deep conversation, talking with her, and he ultimately invites her to receive new life and living water. A woman, an inferior, barely a step up from a servant. She's good for only two things, babies and pleasure. But Jesus believed that she was very special. She mattered. There's still many segments of society, especially Islam, that discount and diminish the value of women and even some churches. Jesus, by his actions, is simply saying, you matter. You matter. People matter. Okay, it's another day. Jesus is in a public place. He's having conversation with people who are non-religious. They call sinners. He's talking with people who use profanity, people that drink too much wine, sometimes even prostitutes and tax collectors. And the religious leaders come along, as they always do. They look with disgust at the people that Jesus is talking to, and then they look at disgust at the rabbi because he's talking to them. How could you associate with those kind of people? And Jesus hears what they're saying, and then he tells the story, actually three stories. As Jesus tells these stories, the listeners begin to realize that there's a common thread in each of the stories. Something of great value is missing. And what is missing really matters to somebody. A lost sheep matters to the shepherd. A woman with ten coins loses one coin and she's frantic because that's all she has. That one coin matters. And a dad who has only two boys and one of them, the prodigal son it's called, leaves home and leads a self-destructive life, goes far away because he doesn't want dad or anyone else to know what he's really doing, spending all the money, being sinful, spends the inheritance, deeply hurts his dad. Now, as the religious leaders listen to the story, it is Jesus' hope that they'll get the message. They don't, most of them, but that was the message. These people are far from God. They're missing from the family. The matter, they matter to God no matter how long they've been missing. No matter how far they've drifted, no matter what condition they're in, they really matter. They do today, they did in that day, like lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. Each one, there's a, there was a search. The second common theme in these stories is that which is missing matters enough to warrant an all-out search. The shepherd searches for the lost coin, or the lost sheep, I'm sorry, and the woman for the lost coin. Uh, coin, and the dad strains his eyes every day, don't you think, for the lost son. Could he be just coming down? It probably wasn't a lane, but in my mind, I see a long lane, and dad looked down that lane every day. Could that be my son? Searching. What's Jesus saying to these critical religious leaders? I am here seeking out these folks. I've come for all people. I'm going to die for all people. He doesn't say that. Well, he does say that to some of them. Every person matters. In Luke 15, the woman finds her lost coin, and she says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. And then it sums up in verse 10, In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So when you repent, when someone asks God to come into their life and become, make it a personal relationship, there's a party in heaven. There's a cosmic celebration across heaven. One person accepts Christ. Everyone knows. The number flashes on the big screen. And in the words of Bill Hybels, 
you have never looked into the eyes of someone who doesn't matter to God. And that's pretty amazing. Every time you make eye contact with a waiter or a waitress or a cashier at the grocery store or a guy that mows your lawn or a politician that you don't even like or an illegal immigrant, every person you lock eyes with matters to God. They are people for whom Jesus Christ died. They matter. In the final hours of Jesus' life, he's hanging on a cross between two thieves. And one of them realizes that Jesus is about to die. Now, these two thieves apparently are bad guys, really bad guys, or they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be dying on a cross. So the one thief reviews his life, and he's, he's not pleased with what he sees, the way he's lived. His failures, he's a loser, he's a criminal. But, I mean, what are you going to do? It's too late to change. It's too late to clean up his act. He can't join a church or a temple or a synagogue. He can't offer God anything except remorse. But suddenly he has this incredible thought as he hangs there and he's about to die. What if the love of this rabbi that I've heard about, the one described as the Son of God, what if God's love was so encompassing that he, even now, would forgive me? What if someone like me, after all, all the things I've done, what, what if I matter? What if I still matter? So he turns to Jesus with that tiny mustard seed size, smaller than the one I held the other day, faith, and he says, Rabbi, sir, is there like any chance that you would remember me when you come into your kingdom? <laughs> and I so love the words used by Alistair Begg to describe that moment. I showed it on the screen a few weeks ago. This is the short version. The man on the cross dies, and he is met by the angel. And the angel says, what are you doing here? And the man says, I don't know. And the angel scratches his head, and he goes, what do you mean you don't know? I don't know. And finally, after much discussion, the angel says he's exasperated. On what basis are you here? And his response, well, the man on the middle cross said I could come. And Jesus said, in spite of all you've done, you still matter. You've mattered since the day of your birth. You mattered when you committed your first crime, when you were arrested the first time, when you got locked up the first time, the day you were condemned to die. There was never a moment when you didn't matter picture of love. God's plan is that kind of love. He wants that kind of love to take root in your heart. That we catch the vision, we all come to repentance, and all people matter to God. I haven't done this for a while, but I'd like to pray a benediction prayer of repentance and pardon because there might be someone or two or three or four that have never really Ask God to forgive them and to come into their life in a personal way. A lot of us just come to church and sit and try to do the right thing. But it needs to be personal. So let me just pray this prayer that you've heard me pray before. And if that's in your heart that you would like to, to actually say, I want to be a Christ follower, then you make this your prayer. When I, first of all, when I confess my sins, you do know what happens. The Bible says they're gone, far as the east is from the west. I may remember them. God chooses not to. Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Please forgive me for living selfishly. I have shut you out of my life. I haven't really acknowledged you as Lord, and I apologize. Please forgive me. Right now, I open the door of my heart, and I invite you to enter. And by faith, I receive you as Lord. Please live in me, and guide me, and show me how to live. And I take myself off of the throne of my life, and I ask you to sit on that throne 
And when I make a decision, I'll ask you, the king of my life, is this the right decision? And so on. Now, thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering my prayer because you know my heart and you know my sincerity. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, sometimes I think ministers try to make it seem too easy, but it isn't difficult at all. It's not easy. It's a little more difficult being a disciple of Christ, but coming to Christ is simply saying, I'm yours. I believe in you. God bless you. If you need anything ever, whether you just committed your life to Christ or you've been a Christian for a hundred years, please know I'm here and I'm at my office all the time and that's what I do and I love to talk about Jesus. So let's stand. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may God give to you his peace in your going out and your coming in, in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears, until you come to stand before Jesus in that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen.